Welcome to CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. because we must, and not because we will. So the man wrote over a century ago, are there things that we forget because we're better off not remembering them? Of course. Life is far more pleasant if we choose only to recall the happier moments. In fact, our very survival might depend on deliberately forgetting many things. I don't know what you're talking about. But you do. You do. You obviously have me confused with someone else. Do you think I could ever forget that face? I've never even been to Europe. Do you think I could ever forget that voice? What are you doing with that gun? I am your executioner. The Ghosts of Yesterday was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact. The 12 hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. America, the melting pot. For centuries, welcoming millions to both its shores. They come here seeking a new life, and soon they become Americans. Accepted, absorbed, assimilated is the word. Part of the whole, a part of the American identity. And for those who wish to be lost in the anonymity that a huge free country allows. May I help you, sir? Oh, uh, just this magazine. Oh, and, uh, yes, a pack of royal filters. Royal filters, just a moment. Well, that'll be 95 cents, sir. Uh, smallest thing I have is a 20. What? It's a little embarrassing. You don't mind, really, do you? No. Great. No. Why are you staring at me like that? Can't be. But it is you. Beg your pardon? I'd know that face anywhere. What are you talking about? And look at you. Thirty years later. Older, graying, well-cut suit. You've become quite the American. I'm afraid you're confusing me with someone else. Quite the American now, but it is you. Who? I swore I'd kill you. Now, hold on. Mother, I swore to myself I'd kill you. Uh, old man, calm I'd, down. I'll kill you. Kill. Now, take it kill. easy, will you? Kill you. No. 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 My heart. Not now. Not before I... Mother. Hey. Are you all right? Old man? Uh, what'd you say your name was again? Uh, Warren. Harry Warren, uh, St. Louis. You say the old man just collapsed, right? That's right, Sergeant. You didn't say anything? No, it happened just as I walked in. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Warren. You mean that's it? Yeah. The doctor says the old man had a heart attack. Yeah, some nights we get half a dozen of these. You know who I feel sorry for? The wives. The poor old wives. All right, sure. What? Uh, I don't know, Carolyn. It's up to the entire committee. Yes, I re... I know, I agree. Look, can we discuss this later? Good. I'll see you at one. Bye-bye. What was that all about, Marge? You know, Carolyn. Uh, uh, meet me for lunch downtown? I already promised to be at the meeting, Steve. Marge, you spend too much time on that membership committee. You're the one who wanted me to be active in the club. Uh, I know. I'm just beginning to wonder. About what? Well, darling, don't take this the wrong way, but... Well, it seems to me the entire membership thing is getting a bit ridiculous. How can you say that? Well, take that couple. Uh, you know, the doctor and his wife that the Petersons nominated last week. 
What was their name? Uh, uh, Vinelli, Vinetti? Uh, Vinataro. Uh, whatever. Why was their request for membership turned down? You know why, Steve. No, I don't. Steve, you know the club policy. Hmm. I know 100% American, right? Why are you suddenly so concerned about my activities at the club? Well, it's just that in the past few months, of, I don't know how to put it. You, you've changed. What do you mean, changed? Now, forgive me for saying this, darling, but you've become a snob. Me? A snob? Okay, you can trace your ancestors back to the Mayflower, and my family goes back to the French and Indian War, and I'm proud of that fact. I know you are, too, but, uh, well, don't you Steve. think... Steve. Yes, yes, I know. I'm doing it again, aren't I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fighting everybody else's battles but my own. Do you think I'm really a snob? Oh, well, if you are, then you're the most beautiful one I know. Uh, that's no answer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to miss my train. Oh, she's early again. All right, all right, I'm coming. Carolyn, I wish you would. Oh. Oh, uh, who are you? Mrs. Stafford. Yes? Mrs. Marjorie Stafford. Um, what do you want? I would like perhaps a moment of your time. If you're selling anything, I, I don't... I sell nothing. I wish to talk. I'm sorry, but I happen to be busy. It is rather an urgent matter. Really, I don't have the time, if you'll excuse me. It is rather cold on these steps. Perhaps you would be courteous enough to let me inside. Perhaps you would prefer it if I called the police? The police. But this is a personal matter, Mrs. Stafford. It concerns a place called Hammondbeer. Hammondbeer? Yes. It is a small village in Western Europe. I... I never heard of it. Are you sure, Mrs. Stafford? Quite sure. But certainly you have heard of Hammondbeer. Why? Well, why should I? You were born there. Won't you come in? You, uh... You have a lovely home, Mrs. Stafford. Would you come to the point? My name is Coslow. Valerius Coslo. What is it you want? But surely you know what I want. Money? Money? You think I am some sort of person who, uh, what is the word, um, extorts money? No one knows where I really come from, Mr. Coslo, not even my husband, and I would like to keep it that way. Are you ashamed? I don't see where that's any of your affair. Mr. Coslow, please, what do you want from me? I am surprised you did not recognize my name. Should I? In my country, or, or should I say our country, I do enjoy quite a reputation. What for? You might say I am a kind of detective. I am retained by the government, although I would gladly work without fee. What do you do, Mr. Coslow? For example, it has taken me many years, but I have finally found you. Why? Why have you been looking for me? It has been over 30 years since the war. You remember the war, Mrs. Stafford? No. I... I was very young at the time. Hmm. I would say eight, nine years old. Yes. It was a most difficult and tragic time. I, for example, worked with the resistance. I recall a particular incident when several American paratroopers had to be sheltered from the Nazis. Not very easy in occupied country, wouldn't you say? Why are you telling me this? The Americans were hidden in this town that was staunchly loyal to the resistance. Eventually they escaped. But you know the rest of the story, don't you? Please, Mr. Coslow. The ending was not quite so happy for the inhabitants of the town. The military commander in that area, a rather vicious SS officer, Captain Dietrich, discovered what had occurred and ordered suitable retribution. The entire town, all of its inhabitants, destroyed. That is all except for one little girl, one little girl with long gold braids who managed to hide in a cellar. Why are you telling me this? The little girl was you. No. You're wrong. I need your help, Mrs. Stafford. You are the only person left alive who can positively identify him. 
Identify who? Captain Hans Dietrich. Dietrich? Hmm. After the way he disappeared, we have reason to believe he emigrated to the United States with a falsified passport. Dietrich is here? In America? All our contact could confirm was that Dietrich had purchased an interest in a corporation called Northern Plastics. Is that all you know? We believe he is using the name of Warren. Warren? Oh, yes. Like you, Mrs. Stafford, he has become totally Americanized. I believe that's the way the expression goes. Now, what we need from you is a positive identification. You mean a look at a picture? Not exactly. We want to extradite him for trial, but your testimony is crucial. You want me to testify in court? I realize the past is painful, Mrs. Stafford. No, but I won't do it. Do you realize how important this is to us, to our country? Your country, Mr. Coslow. So, that is how it is. Mr. Coslow, you don't know how it is. What I was before I came here is nobody's business. If I were to testify, everybody would know. Is that so important to you? Yes. The past is past, Mr. Coslow. I live for the present. I am talking about justice, Mrs. Stafford. Justice. Please, I'd like you to leave. Very well. But I will be back when you have changed your mind. I won't change my mind. Please, I beg you. Think about what you are doing. We have nothing more to discuss. I see. I, I see. Let me just remind you of one thing. The past, I agree, is past. But don't let it fool you. It has mysterious ways of catching up with all of us. Not with me, Mr. Coslow. Not with me. Forgive and forget. That's the motto that the great humanitarians would have us all live by. However, most people usually choose one or the other. There are those things that we would prefer to forgive, but never forget. But more painful, more destructive must be the events our minds choose to forget, but our hearts refuse to forgive. I'll be back shortly for that, too. To look at her, you wouldn't think that Marjorie Stafford was anything other than what she appeared to be, an attractive, 40-ish Midwestern matron who can trace her antecedents back to the Plymouth Rock. It now develops, however, that she has hidden from everyone a devastating past. The sole survivor of a wartime tragedy, she fled to America and created this fictional family tree for herself. A fabric which threatens to become unraveled if she cannot control her conscience. You are the only one who no. can identify no. you. Please, Mrs. Stafford. No, I can't help you. I can't. Please help us bring Dietrich to justice. Oh, don't ask me, please. Don't ask me. Please don't ask me to remember. Honey, honey, honey. <gasps> honey, what, what? what's the matter? <sighs> Oh, Steve. You're, you're having another nightmare. Oh, uh, I'm all right. Marge, hey. Marge, what's the matter? Nothing. I, I didn't. Nothing. It's, it's me, isn't it? No, darling. No, of course not. Really, I, I know I haven't been home as much as I should, Steve, but... believe me, it's not you. It, it's just... Just what? I'm... The horror movie I saw a few nights ago when you were out of town, I just can't get it out of my mind. Okay, Marge. Turn off the light, won't you, honey? Marge, listen, I, I just want you to know I'm your husband. You can talk to me if there's something bothering you. Marge, did you hear me? Marge? Please, Mr. Coslow, why have you come back? I, I already told you I won't be a witness for your government. I won't testify in public. 
You think I am hounding you, don't you? Understand me, Mr. Coslow. I... I appreciate what you feel, but... I have a life here, a new life. I can't jeopardize it. I see. You think that to tell the truth about the past would make a lie of the present? Mr. Coslow, is that all you do with your time? Hunt down ghosts of yesterday? Someone has to remember. Why? There were people. How can you forget them? Your own family, your mother, your father. Don't you owe them something? I have no family. I will be staying at the Carlton Hotel, Mrs. Stafford. I will be there until I receive your call. I don't intend to call you. The ghosts of yesterday have circled your eyes and tortured your sleep. I will be seeing you soon. <laughs> you. It happened again last night, didn't it? What happened? You had another nightmare. Oh, oh Steve, are you going to start that again? Now, honey, it's nothing to be ashamed about. I, I think I know what you're going through. You do? It happened to me when I turned 40. It, it can be a very upsetting time for a person, I know. Oh, and that's what you think is... Well, am I wrong? Is it something else, Marge? No. <laughs> No. You're absolutely right, darling, and that's just what it is. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go out to dinner tonight. What do you say? All right. Hello? Marge, you'll never guess what happened this morning. Steve, what is it? It's fantastic, honey. I think I got the account. What account? Now, look, I, I know I promised you about dinner, but do you mind if we meet you at the restaurant? We? My client. I want you to meet him. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> Love you, honey. Love you. Over here, Marge. Honey, I, I, I want you to meet Harry Warren. Harry, uh, this is my wife, Marge. Warren? Pleasure to meet you, Marge. Harry is executive vice president of Northern Plastics. Oh, and Northern Plastics? Yeah, say, uh, what about uh, cocktails before we order dinner? Marge, uh, your usual? I'm sorry, what? Uh, vodka Collins, darling? Yes, that's fine. Harry? Oh, anything for me, Steve. Anything? Sure. Oh, I'll tell you what. What I really would like right now would be a nice tall glass of beer. Domestic or imported? Well, any is fine with me, Marge. Though there is really one that is supposed to be the best in the world. You can't get it in this part of the country. Oh? Huh? It's imported from the Rhine Valley. A stream with the clearest, purest water in the world. It's called... Hosti? Yes. Well, isn't this delightful? I thought no one else ever heard of it. Few people have. <laughs> and then the girl said, but Mr. Warren, we canceled your reservation a week ago. <laughs> oh, that's great, Harry. Uh, say, Marge, uh, remember what happened the time we took the trip to Wisconsin? What? Uh, it was a tiny resort, and the innkeeper couldn't speak a word of English. Really? <laughs> can you believe it, Harry? Some people can live in this country for years and never learn the language. All this poor guy could speak was... Uh, German. <laughs> can you imagine? In the heart of America? It's hard to believe. Uh, do you speak German, Mr. Warren? <laughs> I mean, uh, Harry? No, not a word, Marge. Why do you ask? Uh, it's just that you seem like the type of person who, uh, 
The what? The might. <laughs> Isn't that silly? Carson Hotel? Uh, yes, do you have a guest registered there by the name of Coslo? Valerius Coslo? Yes, please. Mr. Coslo, I'd like to talk to you, not over the phone. Can we meet somewhere? All right. I am glad that you finally decided to see me, Mrs. Stafford. I had to speak with you. So I assumed. I met Harry Warren last night. Yes, I know. You know? But of course. Do you believe it was such an incredible coincidence, Mrs. Stafford? But how could... How is not important. Tell me. Did you recognize him? Yes. Yeah. Warren is Hans Dietrich. You are positive. Yes. I'm quite positive. Excellent, Mrs. Stafford. I must admit to you, this is a satisfaction which I... I seldom experience in my line of endeavor. What happens now? My government contacts your government, and we go through some brief formalities which will enable me to extradite Dietrich for trial. And what about me? Your testimony, of course, is essential to the case against him. Mr. Coslow, I thought you understood me when I said I that I... I assumed you had changed your mind. Without you, there is no case against Dietrich. I already told you, Mr. Coslow, I'm perfectly willing to confirm Warren's identity in private. But I refuse to become the object of worldwide publicity. But we need you. Do you have any idea what it would do to me? To the life I have here? Why should it do anything? Because... People here in this town, they care about who a person is, where they come from. Do they? Look, I, I really don't want to discuss it. I have identified the man for you, and that's all I'm going to do. Mrs. Stafford, that is what your mind tells you. But what does your heart tell you? Oh, why did you have to come here? Why did you have to dig this thing up again? It was dead and buried. Was it? Of course. You never thought about it until a week ago when I rang your doorbell? You expect me to believe that, Mrs. Stafford? I don't want to talk about it anymore. I've got to be going. Mrs. Stafford. Maria. What did you call me? Maria. Or have you also buried your real name? I won't do it, Mr. Coslow. I won't go back. One way or other, you will go back. No. But you will, Maria. Don't call me that. Don't you want to see Dietrich brought to justice? Yes, but certainly he can hang without me. Hang, did you say? Well, that's still the official method of execution in your country, isn't it? <laughs> we do not have a death penalty any longer, Mrs. Stafford. What? Having survived the violence and barbarism of the last war, our, our people realize the senselessness of killing. Dietrich was a murderer. Murder must not be permitted to perpetuate itself. To demand an eye for an eye would place us on the same level as those who would destroy us. This is unbelievable. You're asking me to bear my soul to the entire world in return for what? Justice, Mrs. Stafford. Justice? A man cold-bloodedly sends hundreds of people to their death, and where is the justice? He will spend the rest of his days in prison. Prison? I've seen the new prisons, Mr. Coslow. A nice, comfortable bed, hot meals, the latest books to read, perhaps a tennis court, too. Please. And that's what you call justice, huh? Well, I don't want to hear any more platitudes about what great humanitarians we've all become. You listen to me. There is nothing wrong with an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's as old as the Bible. And if it's endured for thousands of years, there's a reason for it. There are other weapons against evil besides killing. Why did you have to bring that man into my life again? Why have you resurrected an old nightmare? There is only one way to end the nightmare. You're right. But not the way you think. No, Mrs. Stafford. You must not. I must not what? I know what you are thinking. What am I thinking? You. You intend to see Dietrich dead. 
after her? I recognize the look in your eyes. It is a look I once had in my own. I don't know what you're talking about. You are thinking that Diedrich must be made to give an eye for an eye. And shouldn't he be? He must be killed, isn't that right? Yes. Yes. It doesn't mean anything unless he pays. Pays in the only just way. No, Mr. Stefan. He must die. Even if... Even if what? Even if you have to kill him yourself, Mrs. Stefan? Well, what kind of an assumption is that to make? As if one could actually picture Marjorie Stafford killing anyone. Nevertheless, she has just admitted that it is a deed she would like to see done. And you know what they say, if you want something done, you're better off doing it yourself. But that is something we leave for Act 3. What force is it that drives people to murder? Oh, there have always been those who kill for no logical reason at all. There always will be. But what of those seemingly gentle, good-natured souls who suddenly with calmness, with calculated coolness, perform an act of violence? It's said that all of us are capable of such an act, for we all have a certain limit to which we can be pushed. A man can only be driven so far. A woman, too, for that matter. Mr. Coslow, that's ridiculous. Is it? I hate Dietrich. I want to see him dead. But to even contemplate killing him myself, that's ridiculous. You will testify for the prosecution, then? No. I haven't changed my mind. I warn you, Mrs. Stafford. Some way or other, you are deciding on your own method of justice for Dietrich. I only hope you make the right choice. Mr. Coslow. No. This time, I am the one who leaves first. There is nothing else for me to say now. Wait. You would not listen to anything I could say right now. Please, Mr. Coslow. Goodbye, Maria. Oh, no, no, no more for me, honey. I, I couldn't need another thing. Anyhow, I don't want to be late for my golf date. Oh, I didn't know you were going to the club this morning. Mm, asked Harry Warren to play. The... Oh, well, clumsy of me. Over here, uh, let me help you clean no, that no, up. No, 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 uh... it's all right. So, uh, you're uh, playing golf with Harry Warren. Mm, in fact, I'd better get going. Steve, I suppose you really want to sew up his account. Huh? Oh, this isn't business, son. I really like the guy. Warren? You like him? Well, you have to admit, he's a pretty likable fellow. Oh, by the way, I uh, agreed to put his name up for membership this spring. In the country club? <laughs> what do you really know about him? Oh, Marge, you know just as well as I do. He's just the type of person they want there. Wealthy, cultured, sociable. What's not to like about him? What if I were to tell you that... That what? Well, that Harry Warren isn't who you believe he is. Uh huh. Who is he, then? He's actually a... a former SS officer. Captain Hans Dietrich. <laughs> Marge, uh, Harry Warren, an ex-Nazi? Yes. <laughs> Honey, now, listen, I... I really don't think you should kid like that. I'm not. I mean, you really think it's in good taste? Steve, uh, I'm trying to tell you... Th uh, by the way, I, I hope you don't mind. I, I took the liberty of inviting him over for dinner tomorrow night, uh, why don't you make that wonderful chili of yours? He's coming here for dinner? Honey, I, uh... I get the feeling you don't particularly like Harry. I don't. I can't understand why. You just wait till you get to know him better. Know him better? Sure. You and I will be seeing a lot of him. Thank you for this dinner, Marge. It was absolutely delicious. <laughs> Isn't she a great cook? You are a lucky man, Steve. <laughs> well, actually, Harry, my husband is very easy to please at the kitchen table after four years of army food. <laughs> Anything beats those K rations. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do during the war, Harry? Oh, I uh, was in the army. Really? 
Were you overseas? Uh, uh, honey, I'm sure Harry doesn't want to talk about the war right now, do you, Harry? Actually, I do find it a bit depressing. I guess it's because at heart I'm really a peace-loving man. Marge, you were deliberately rude at dinner. Oh, Steve, come on. You're making a mountain out of a mole. Harry was a guest in our house. I... I think you could have acted a little more gracious. Name one ungracious thing I said. No, it isn't anything you said. It was just the way you... Well, you were giving him looks this evening that could have given anyone frostbite. Really? Really. I I can't tell you how embarrassed I am. Well, I am sure that he didn't notice anything. Maybe not, but I did. Now, what have you got against the poor guy? Steve, could we just... Drop the whole thing? This just isn't like you, Marge, for... Goodness sake, what did Harry Warren ever do to you? Carson Hotel? Uh, I'd like to speak with Mr. Valerius Coslow, please. Thank you. Hello? Uh, well, uh, when will he be back? What? Well, uh, he couldn't have checked out. Are you sure he... I see. All right. Honey, uh, who is on the phone? Uh, I was just talking to Carolyn. Steve, I've been thinking. Let's, let's go away, just the two of us. Oh, sounds great. We'll do it next weekend. Why not now? This weekend. Oh, I can't, honey. I've got to be in Denver for that audit. You're flying to Denver? You mm. just came back? Oh, what can I do? My hands are tied. Spangler Continental decides that this is the time to declare bankruptcy. Steve, take me with you. Well, to Denver? What on earth for? I just don't want to be here alone. Well, but I can't take you. I wouldn't have any time to see you when Please. I'm out. Well, honey, look, I know it hasn't been easy for you with me away so much, but, but I promise when I get back, I'm going to take the entire week off. We can go anywhere you like. Now, how about it? But I, 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 I... Wow, would you look at the time? I'm going to miss my plane. Well, I must say, Marge, I was more than a little surprised when I got your phone call. Oh? Why was that? Well, I was under the impression that uh, you didn't particularly care for me. Well, Harry, I'm really sorry if I gave you that impression. Frankly, I'm confused. Why? Are well, you asking to see me with uh, Steve out of town and all? Well, now, what's so confusing about it? You are a very attractive man, Harry. Oh, Marge. And I can tell you aren't exactly indifferent to me. It's just that I never thought, I mean, the way you act. Harry, let me tell you something. You have no idea what it's like being married to Steve. Now, he's a sweet person, and I'm quite fond of him. But, I mean, he's never home. Are you telling me that you... Well, Steve, yeah, plenty of times. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Sit home and darn stocking? I don't know what to say. Now, you thought I didn't like you. Don't you see, that's the way I always have to play it when Steve's around to set him off the track. It's just that I can't believe that... I mean, you don't look like the type of woman... Are you of... saying that you didn't feel it, too? Feel what? What do they call it? Um, kind of vibration? Uh, chemistry? Of course I felt it. I felt it from the first time we met in that restaurant. What are you doing tomorrow night? I had no plans. Would you want to see me? Yes, I would. Where? It, um, it can't be anywhere in town. You know, people would talk somewhere out of the way where nobody would recognize. Marge, I know a place. It's the cabin of an old friend of mine. He's out of the country now, but he gave me the key. Oh? And believe me, it is so isolated, no one would ever see us. No one would ever suspect. Oh, good. I can follow you up there in my car. I still can't get over this. Harry, just one thing. I promise you won't mention this to anybody. Of course I won't. And, uh, you're sure it doesn't really bother you? Being Steve's friend and everything? Well, Steve is my friend, but you know what they say. All's fair in love and war. Yes, that is what they say. <laughs> My, this is quite a little cabin in the woods. 
Your friend must be very well off. Hmm? Very. Certainly is isolated. Your friend must like privacy. <laughs> he does indeed. Oh, is, is that a terrace over there? Yes. Would you like to take a look at the view? Let's go out on the terrace. Wow. That's quite a drop, isn't it? Forty feet at least. Hey, I didn't realize how chilly it's gotten. Let's go back inside. No, let's stay out just a little longer. Well, you say it's 40 feet from here to the rocks. A fall like that would kill a person, wouldn't it? Most probably. Marge, let's go inside. Not yet. Marge, what the devil? It's Steve's gun. He keeps one in the house. Why are you pointing it at me? I want you to stand near the rail. Marge, what's this all about? Do you really think I would ever be unfaithful to my husband? Marge, give me that gun. Don't come any closer or I swear I'll use it. I don't understand. Is this some kind of joke? A joke? <laughs> no, this is most certainly not a joke. Well, then... With... Don't move. I mean it. Marge, what's going on? What have I ever... Done it? Is that what you were going to say? Harry Warren hasn't done anything. On the other hand, Captain Hans Dietrich has. Who? Don't look so surprised. I know who you really are. What are you talking about? In some ways, we have a lot in common. We're both survivors. You aren't making any sense. Both of us escaping the past, clinging to new identities, working year after year to remove every vestige of the old life. Even down to losing our accents. You are not an American? I spent my early childhood in a village called Hammenbeer. Hammenbeer? Surely you remember it. During the war, we were occupied by the Germans. I was little, only eight. But I can remember they were commanded by a very young officer. His eyes are cold gray. A man who never laughed. Never smiled. He was always posting pages of rules we were to follow. I think you've gone out of your mind. Let me finish. One day he was angry. I'd never seen any face so full of anger, rage. I was young. I didn't understand how things were. Something about helping soldiers, Americans... I was afraid of that face, the anger. So I hid in a doorway. I hid when the captain made everyone gather on the village square and made a long, hard speech about treason and how he must make an example of our town. Why are you telling me this? Because I want you to know the reason you are to die. You think I'm Dietrich? I know you are Dietrich. You're making a mistake. I've never even been to Belgium. How would you know that Hammondier was in Belgium? Now, look, Mark. You can lie to the rest of the world, but you can't lie to me, Dietrich. <sighs> As if I could ever forget those eyes. And that voice. Your voice. Giving the final order. To level my village. Admit it. Admit who you are. I am Hans Dietrich. Captain SS. Military number 172-93481. I have brought you here, Captain Dietrich, for the purpose of administering justice. You have been found guilty of the murder of the village of Hammondbeer. Guilty of the murder of 271 people. My mother... My father, my two sisters. These things are necessary in times of war. Innocent people. Treason is punishable by death. I now sentence you to death. Get up on that ledge. Now. I see. You intend to make me jump. You yourself said the fall would kill, didn't you? What is the matter, Mrs. Stafford? Your face... You don't even look afraid. I am not afraid. 
Aren't you going to beg me for your life? No. It is almost a relief to no longer deny who I truly am. I am Hans Dietrich, and I am proud to join my friends, my fallen comrades. Go ahead, shoot. Shoot! I am not afraid to die like a soldier. There is no greater glory than to die like a soldier. What are you waiting for? Shoot! No. No, it's what you want me to do, isn't it? It's the easy way out for you. It's merciful, quick, almost glorious for you. No. No, this isn't justice. You are afraid. No. I'm not afraid. Not anymore. I'm taking you back. Back to my old country. Back to justice. And she did. Captain Hans Dietrich is spending the rest of his life in prison, thanks to the testimony of Marge Stafford. Of course, Marge and her husband found it necessary to quit the country club, but somehow they have discovered it doesn't really matter. One thing that does matter, however, is that you stay with us until I return with some final words. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote the words, One man's justice is another's injustice. One man's beauty, another's ugliness. One man's wisdom, another's folly. How true the thought. But also, it is true that ultimately, there is only one good and one evil. One right and one wrong. And if the human beings of this world finally ever come to realize that there is a universal ethic, mankind will have reached its golden age. Our cast included Terry Keene, Russell Horton, Leon Janney, and Mandel Kramer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy in the YouTube search bar. Until then, 